Hello, my name is Alex Isles and welcome. In today's episode we're going to be looking at some of the German and Celtic deities worshipped by the Romans up here on Hadrian's Wall. Hello and welcome back and in today's episode we're going to be looking at some of the German and Celtic deities who were worshipped by the Romans but also some of their locations up here on the northern frontier on Hadrian's Wall and some of their statues as well. I've just got Crawborough Roman Fort behind me because of the fact that just next to this there was a temple to a deity called Coventina. So why don't we start off with Coventina herself and we'll talk about her cult right now. So right here we have some of the images of Coventina from Hadrian's Wall and up on the northern frontier. Now initially in the 19th century when the archaeologist John Clayton discovered the shrine of Coventina on Hadrian's Wall, everyone believed that she was a native British deity. Possibly even a genus loci or a spirit of a location has gradually evolved to become a goddess herself. She's described as a goddess but also as a nymph which was more like a water spirit up here on the frontier. Now when they were doing the excavations, they were quite early excavations, so Victorian archaeology unfortunately is quite rough compared to modern standards. And when it's quite rough, that means that you have to sort of take it with a pinch of salt and you have to look at how they discovered things. But they were still pretty good, they were able to see the layers, they were able to understand what was going on and really get a picture or an image of how things were constructed. Now before the construction of Hadrian's Wall, there seems to have been a number of bodies of water in the area. And when there were a number of bodies of water, they started constructing Hadrian's Wall and it seems to have caused some issues with the construction. So they built a wall and they started creating an area where there would be more boggy water and it would start to become a pool. Now as it became a pool, later on what happened was that there was a Roman fort which you can just see up here constructed and which was called Broccolita, which translated roughly means the place of badgers. That's what people at least believe. And so when Broccolita was created, the soldiers moved in and the current archaeological theory is that they suddenly looked at this pool of water and they went, well, what's this? And they said, well, it's a, just a pool of water that was caused by the construction of Hadrian's Wall. And then they started going, well, let's, let's also venerate a spirit at this location. Let's venerate a, a female water deity or a nymph so we can get the benefits of venerating this local spirit. And so they started building the shrine of Coventina and when they built the shrine of Coventina it was a place of worship right up until the late 4th century when new laws came in in the Roman Empire that forbid the worship of other gods as the Roman Empire became Christian. At that point, it seems that all of the altars that were within the shrine were then put within the shrine, or what was later described as Coventine as well, and when they were placed there, it was then covered over and destroyed and forgotten about. And it seems it was very respectfully done that they were lowered in there, put into the water, and then left. So it was, almost seems that the last of the um, non-Christian worshippers were then taking apart their local religious sites, which also was seen to have been done at the Mithraeum just behind me as well so uh, which we'll come to in another episode when we talk about Mithras and Sol Invictus so when these things were done that meant that when archaeologists came along in the 19th century they excavated Coventina as well and they were amazed at what they found they found over 18,000 coins that had been deposited with the oldest coin actually dating back to Mark Antony obviously famous uh, Roman general and also the opponent of Augustus Caesar that was the oldest coin and then there were 4th century coins in there as well. So it seems that people were throwing coins into the well which even today across so many parts of the world people still throw coins into wells for luck and so you can see that sort of ritual or has still continued. And they also found altars dedicated to Coventina and other deities as well. For instance there was another one dedicated to Minerva and other deities too. So interesting one just to see that. So when they then had that, it was all put into the water and it was left until it was discovered in the 19th century. So we have different depictions of Coventina. So first of all, just directly behind me here, 
So right here we have Coventina depicted with two of her attendants. Though some people have also suggested it could be almost like a free-form goddess where she has different aspects similar to how Diana is represented because Diana has two other aspects alongside being a huntress deity. So people suggest that that could be the case with Coventina right here. Others suggest that it is the goddess and then two attendants and then that's how it's been depicted. But then that was discovered right there. Then as well alongside that we also have another altar of Coventina right here as well where she's lying on her side, she looks as if she's at rest and she is depicted wearing her dress and there's the aspect of water and the water nymph aspect of her right there which you can also see on this other side with the fact that she's depicted on her side as a water nymph. So when you have these altars, it's interesting because in the 19th century, when she was initially discovered, everyone thought she was a native British deity. They thought that maybe she was a spirit of a location that was venerated by the troops because they wanted to bring that location spirit to bear to look after them. So the idea was that when you move to a new location, you find out who the local gods are and then you venerate them because obviously if they're the local gods, you don't want them to go against you. You don't want them to make your troops unwell. You don't want them to back um, the local and if they back the locals then maybe the locals will have military victory over you so you start setting up shrines and altars to the local gods and then by setting up shrines and altars to the local gods they will then be on your side and that will give you military victory it will give you health success prosperity all of those things there and so for a long time Coventina was thought to be a native British god but now shrines to her are being discovered in Spain in the Rhineland and in Gaul and so because of this, it's now believed that she may actually be a German deity. And if she's a German deity, she's then been taken from the, the, with the German troops and then brought to Britain. And the story is actually maybe possibly slightly different. So earlier on, I was talking about the construction of the wall. So when the wall was constructed, there was a pool of water. It was causing difficulty. So they then built the walls, which would then eventually become Coventine as well. And so the possibility is that rather than it being a case that there's a local deity there that needs to be honoured, what's possibly happened is that Germans have come along, have brought Coventina with them. And as they've brought Coventina with them, they've seen this well or this pool of water and they've gone, well, that's perfect because we worship Coventina back home with these pools of water and we sacrifice items into these pools of water. And so this is perfect. We'll just build a shrine to her here and we can continue her worship as we do back home. Another possibility is, is that they saw this pool of water and then they knew that this area was a boggy piece of ground because we know going right back into the Neolithic there is an association with bo boggy pieces of ground being as a place of sacrifice, especially in the Bronze Age where items are taken and they're sacrificed into uh, water, they are placed into the water as a votive offering. And so it's a possibility that this area already was important because it was an area of water, an area of bogginess, and it may have been significant to the native Britons already. And so what's happened is they know it's an area of significance, so they then take Coventina and they place her altar, her shrine there with the well in the centre, and then they bring in together both this possible German cult alongside the native British idea of what there might be a spiritual aspect to this water body, and then created this this location where people could come and worship and then that was used for centuries until finally it was deconstructed placed all of these shrines were placed in the water and then were de destroyed if you'd like to have an, uh, a little explore around Coventina as well, what I'll do is in the description I'm going to put a link to a 3D reconstruction of it which was recently done and then you can walk around and have a look yourself and have a look at some of the items that were found there too. It's just a website link in the description below. So why not we move on now to the next deity, which is going to be Lug or Lugos, and we're going to be talking about him next. So right here we have Lugos, and Lugos is an interesting deity because I almost put him under the native British gods, but I decided to actually put him under the German and Gaulish and Celtic gods section instead. And the reason why is because of the fact that he is venerated throughout Gaul. And he's a Gaulish god, but he's also very heavily involved in British myths and legends. So in the northwest of England, there is a city called Carlisle. And Carlisle is quite an important city. And this city here, in Roman times, was called Lugavellium, or the Fortress of Lug. 
and so that was a location that was associated with him. Now Lug again is a very interesting god because in Roman times he was seen as one of the primary deities of the Celtic or Gaulish peoples in Europe. If you follow this channel for any time now you'll know that I don't necessarily like the term Celtic because I think it covers all of Europe under a same sort of blanket term when actually there's so much nuance amongst the various tribes and I prefer breaking it down even to these huge terms like Britain, Gaul and German and all of those other peoples as well even though those are huge blanket terms in their own rights. But he was an important deity to the Gauls and when he was an important deity to the Gauls he was a warrior deity he was a king deity, he was a master craftsman deity, and alongside this as well, he was also a hero. And interestingly enough, Lug continues in the Welsh and also in the Irish mythologies as well. And when he continues on, there's a lot of sort of what would be called early medieval or dark age stories which are written down in monasteries about the old Celtic deities. So therefore the Lugos that we see later on who is seen in the Welsh mythology and the Irish mythology might be a small um, aspect of where the previous Celtic deities mythology has just continued to be told and told and told and new stories been put onto them. And so he's actually quite an interesting deity because again the question is, is, is he a native British deity who is worshipped because he's just seen as one of these cross-cultural dark gods that is worshipped in Gaul, is worshipped in other places as well where you have Gaulish or Celtic peoples and therefore he's also in Britain, he's also in Wales, he's also in Ireland. Or is he an adopted deity? Is he an adopted deity in the fact that what's happened is that he's been brought in with Gaulish troops? Is it the possibility that the native Britons didn't worship Lug or Lugos in that way and therefore when the troops arrive they've uh, come from Gaul and so they built Lugavellium to honour him because there may have been a concept of a location right in the area which was dedicated to a native deity and this native deity may have been a king god or could have been a craftsman god or a hero deity and so they're going well actually those aspects are very similar to our Lug or Lug Lugos. And so because of that, they've brought that in and they've said, right, this fortress that we're building, we're dedicating it to Lug. And so because of that, you get Lugavellium. On the other side of the coin, he may already be pre-existing. He may be worshipped here. And there may also be connections that already exist in the British Isles with mainland Europe. And the way of thinking of that is that the Irish Sea goes down, connects in with northern France, with western France and with northern Spain and so the possibility is that traders from there were coming up through the Irish Sea and were trading with the west coast of the British Isles therefore they may have brought their god with them they may have set up small little colonies where they were trading with the native Britons and therefore that's this cross-cultural assimilation where Lug is then adopted by the Britons as this craftsman and um, hero god and so that's how he may have survived it may also be that he's the Gaulish deity and then what's happened is that as the Roman period's gone on he's survived in Britain as a Gaulish deity worshipped by the Gaulish troops who were brought into Britain to station the nation and when they're stationed here his stories then percolate out into Wales in the British Isles and then across the Irish Sea into Ireland and so then they are saved as the stories that then become the mytholo mythologies that we see later on in the early Middle Ages. Again, lots to think about there, lots to sort of break apart, but have a write in the comments and tell me what you think of Lug. Do you think he's more likely a British deity who's there, or is he an adopted deity, or is he a mixture of both? An idea that already existed, but then had a new name put on it when they arrived and they go, oh, that's Lugos, and they recognize him right there and then create Lugavellium in the northwest of Britain. We're now gonna move on to another deity who's another king deity or a highly powerful god in his own right, and that is Tyrannus. Now right here we have Tyrannus and Tyrannus is a Gaulish deity who was brought into the British Isles. He may have already existed in certain areas which were more influenced by Gaul but as the Romans bring in Gaulish troops to station in Britain that's when we start seeing Tyrannus's cult up and around the place. So just right here we have a statue of him from Cumbria and so here you can see some of his key features which is also reflected in this statue from Gaul or modern day France. So you can see in both hands he's holding lightning bolts and in the other hand he's holding a wheel. So he was a sky deity, again probably coming from the same root as Jupiter, you know this 
And this Indo-European sky god who is head of a pantheon, who's seen responsible for the sky, for lightning, for clouds, and all of that sort of power as well. So you can see that with Tyrannus, and he becomes paired with Jupiter. And so many of the temples in Gaul would have both Tyrannus and Jupiter together, or they would be uh, Tyrannus in the form of Jupiter. So quite an interesting one there. So the Gauls then take their native uh, god that they have, Tyrannus, and they, when the Romans come along, they say, right, actually it's very similar to our deity, Jupiter, so you're going to worship him as Jupiter Tyrannus. And so from there, you can see that percolates out Roman culture then becomes more influential because the Roman style of worship comes in and that develops from there. Up here in Northern Britain on Hadrian's Wall and on the frontier, Tyrannus is generally found within places where you have auxiliary forts with Gaulish troops. And so that's when you start finding these wonderful little wheels. And so these wheels here are little icons or, uh, that you have that would have been important to the Gaulish troops. So you find them at places like Segedunum Roman Fort. This one here is from the Great North Museum Hancock and in other locations like that. And so it's probable that a soldier would have carried this little wheel with him. And if he's a Gaulish soldier, he might bring it out. So he may have had little prayers or little rituals that he did to honor the deity. And so because of that, Tyrannus's cult becomes an important part of the, the soldiers up here in Northern Britain. And so you can understand that these Gaulish troops, as they settled up here in the auxiliary forts, some of them would have stayed, some of them would have gone back to Gaul. They would have then maybe sort of married, lo so then they would have possibly married locals, had children here, and then those children would then have picked up the worship of Tyrannus or Jupiter Tyrannus within those local families. And so then he becomes more of a British deity as a part of the cultural milieu of the Hadrian's Wall frontier, the northern frontier of Britain. Another interesting factor as well is that the Roman poet Lucian actually says that Tyrannus was one of the free Celtic deities who human sacrifice was practiced to. And again, I have no problem in believing that. Uh, we do know across Europe, as I've mentioned in other episodes as well, human sacrifice was practiced. And in other parts of the world, obviously, as well, we can see that where human sacrifice has been practiced for thousands of years. The type of human sacrifice that you've been most aware of from the history you've been taught growing up, but in all cultures, it is apparent at some point in human history. And so because of that, um, it seems that the Gauls would have practiced their own form of human sacrifice dedicating to Tyrannus, and when they sacrificed to him, the Romans were very much against human sacrifice, and they would actually suppress it wherever they found it. And again, there is an, a certain element here as well, where we have to take into account there's probably some Roman propaganda going on, because the Romans wanted to portray other cultures as barbaric, needing to be conquered, needing to be Romanized, combined as well with their personal belief that they'd been given power by Jupiter to subjugate the world. So because of that, a good Cassius Bailey or reason for war might actually be to say, well, these people practice human sacrifice, they're barbaric, they're horrendous. So because of that, we're gonna go in, we're gonna stop the human sacrifice, and we're going to be important and show them how to actually worship the gods. Because obviously they would believe that their gods were the real gods, and then they were wearing other hats or you know different costumes when they were interacting with other cultures which again is why Tyrannus is so easily then combined with Jupiter to become this new god who is acceptable within Roman Gaul. So there's an interesting one for you right there and have a think about that as well when you look at the Romans or also the Celtic gods because these Celtic gods don't jump out fully formed into our history books. They are interpreted through Roman and Greek sources and we have to understand them within that context which makes it even more difficult for people today when they're trying to find the, the original Tyrannus or the original Celtic or German deity before their interactions with the Romans. Well, now we move on to one of my favorite Celtic or Gaulish deities, Eponia. So right here, we have Eponia. And we've got some British depictions of Eponia right here and right here. And then we've got a continental or Gaulish depiction of Eponia. Now, when I say the name Eponia, it's probably a little bit familiar to you because it's actually the root word of the English word pony that we have today. Eponia is a very interesting deity. She is a Gaulish deity, or possibly even Celtic, if you'll forgive the use of the word, um, who was worshipped across much of Northern and Western Europe. When she's worshipped in that area, 
the Romans start to hire both Gaulish and Germans into their army as auxiliaries and the Roman uh, army composition lacks a lot of cavalry support so they rely more heavily on the Gaulish, the Spanish, other cultures like that to provide the cavalry support for their armies as auxiliary or helpers and then those forces there supplement the Roman army by providing cavalry support and so because of that in the Roman pantheon when we went through some of those gods before in other episodes you'll notice that there's no horse deity um, and to a certain level Poseidon is associated with horses but again that's a lot more to do with waves and things like that and so he is, um, has a responsibility over horses but he's not a horse deity he's not a cavalry deity in his own right and so because of that Eponia is a really useful goddess she is adopted into the Roman pantheon because of the fact that she is responsible or able to provide that level of worship and she becomes the worship uh, and she becomes the deity for cavalrymen for equestrians or the knightly class and alongside that as well for anyone who works with horses anyone who works with donkeys mules ponies all of that equine group of animals and so from that we get this deity and she's worshipped across the Roman Empire and she's a really interesting deity as well because she's the only Celtic or Gaulish deity who's worshipped in the city of Rome and has her own temple because of her importance to do with horses and so when she's adopted she becomes this deity who is then a core part of the Roman pantheon and we can see dedications to her across the Roman Empire. So to start off with there's this really simple shrine and this is in the Great North Museum Hancock in Newcastle and it's one of my absolute favourites. You've got a little horse or a pony or a donkey represented on this and it's quite clear if you know the symbols that this is a little shrine to a pony or possibly by a cavalryman or by someone who works a lot with horses and it's just a very simple little shrine that would have been set up possibly a libation or a, um, a drink offering is poured over the top and as it's poured over the top you say a prayer to Eponia for the area that you're petitioning the goddess for so that's a lovely little one there sometimes it's the more simple ones that aren't ornate that really sort of capture my attention my heart and I really love these ones here this one here is from Maryport in Cumbria and is another really interesting one because it's a base of a pillar. So you can see the pillar comes out the top, there's a little indent in the top of the pillar where possibly a wooden pillar would have been placed or possibly even another shrine or something like that. But again we can see a ponia. Now the interesting thing is a ponia is sometimes depicted a number of different ways but you can see she's sitting side saddle on the back of a horse and this is the goddess Aponia right there and the horse is then moving quite quickly you can see the motion in it right there then we also have a very traditional Gaulish depiction of Aponia where she is sat astride the horse the horse is right there you can see a wonderful depiction of the horse and her arm is raised and so this goddess here starts off as a, a Celtic or a Gaulish um, horse deity she then becomes more associated with cavalry and with horse riding and then from there becomes a core part of the Roman pantheon due to the fact that she represents an area where the Romans within their own gods have a deficiency they don't have an aspect to cover this and due to the military nature of the Roman Empire it is important that you have a goddess who is then able to represent that element of your warfare and so that way you have something for cavalrymen for other people as well who can worship this goddess and she becomes very popular and you're also incorporating in these new Gaulish and other Celtic peoples into your army bringing them in and so from that it is enable it's in a way to actually help to um, culturally amalgamate these new peoples because they go well actually they're not just taking all of our gods and telling us that they're actually Jupiter and Minerva uh, Juno or another deity as well but actually they've taken one of our core gods they're all now worshipping them on the same level as their deities so that's why I find Eponia really interesting and so I really hope you'll enjoy that and have a good look at some of the things just google Eponia and have a look at some of the interesting facts about her that you can see online and some of the other depictions of her throughout the world but these ones up here are from northern Britain whereas this one is Gaulish so I really hope you've enjoyed this episode today where we've looked at four deities 
from both the Germanic and the Gaulish world and how they were then incorporated into the Roman worship both up here on the northern frontier of the Roman Empire on Hadrian's Wall but alongside that as well across the whole of the empire as well and how different gods may have been adopted into the worship systems of other regions of the empire so for instance Coventina being brought to Britain if she is a German deity and alongside this as well gods like Lug who may have already had a pre-existing deity system within the British Isles but then have a new name placed on them when the Gaulish troops arrive through to Aponia who fills in a gap within the Roman system. I really hope you've enjoyed today's episode. If you have, please do like and subscribe, share the video with your friends, write a comment below, let's start a discussion about some of these deities and what you think about them. And if you'd like to support me further, I do also have a Patreon where you can actually support me and the link is just in the description below as well. As always, thank you so much for watching and stay safe and well and I hope you'll join me for another video in the near future.